Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Steeped in antiquity, contested, conquered, and imagined throughout centuries, Jerusalem exists as a uniquely holy city to the three, world's three major monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Its sacred symbolic power derives not only from the fact that it contains the greatest concentration of holy places and sites, but that it remains the location of religious fervor and seasonal pilgrimage. The Alaska Mosque, the site of Muhammad's alleged legendary night journey to heaven, the Western or Wailing Wall, the only visible remainder of the second Jewish temple form part of the sacred temple mount or noble sanctuary. This revered site is the scene of continuing concentration, confrontation and communal friction between Palestinian Muslims and Israeli Jews, mirroring the wider national dispute over territorial rights, religious freedoms and political sovereignty. The special status of Jerusalem has been officially recognized and affirmed by successive Ottoman, British, Jordanian and Israeli powers, impacting the city's taxation, security arrangements, civil legislation and administrative control. For more than 85 years, the international community, the representatives of the Zionist movement and later the State of Israel, the representative of the Arab world and especially the Palestinians, have engaged in attempts to find ways to make the city of Jerusalem a city of peace. And over this period, more than 65 plans have been tabled for discussions around the central focus of the plans proposed revolving around Jerusalem and the issue mainly revolving around the issue of sovereignty. Who owns Jerusalem and who has the right to control the city? Today, Jerusalem remains central to the Arab-Israeli conflict, acting both as an icon for the political and religious aspirations of Israelis and Palestinians, as a microcosm for the ebb and flow of relations between them. It simultaneously represents the asp an asp inspiration and an obstacle for peace due to its strategic and symbolic role as the desired capital of both, both national communities. Despite the ongoing negotiations over peace proposals, the continual breakdown in the process has resulted in radicalization of both sides. This is demonstrated by the various Muslim intifadas and calls for jihad by various terrorist organizations. The Israelis, on the other hand, continued an expansionist policy of Jewish settlements into Arab neighborhoods and maintenance of a strong military and security presence throughout the city. Jerusalem is a tiny city, remote from us in culture and distance, and yet it is never far from the news. Everybody has heard of Jerusalem. We all know of its war-torn history and its constant battle for peace. In fact, we all know enough about, of Jerusalem to consider this title for tonight perhaps a little far-fetched. But we are told in scripture not to consider this to be a marvelous thing. Come to 2nd of Chronicles 6 and verse 6 with me, please. This is God speaking. But I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name might be there, and have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Here we learn that Jerusalem is so important in God's eyes that he has chosen to associate his name with it. By doing this, he is telling us that Jerusalem since that time has been the preeminent city in the world in his eyes. This is because it is the capital of the land of Israel, the home of God's chosen people, the Jews. Now extending this thought further, come across to Psalm 122. A psalm written by King David concerning Jerusalem. Psalm 122, reading verses 6 and 7. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. Here we are told to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. God does not want us to pray for things that are outside of his will. By praying for the peace of Jerusalem, we are praying for the fulfillment of the meaning of the name of the city. For the fulfillment of God's purpose with the city 
and indeed the world. Jerusalem has a long history and a very significant role throughout scripture. Many prophecies have been made about it, many fulfilled and many yet to be fulfilled, and peace is so often part of this. The name Jerusalem itself is associated with peace. In its first occurrence in the Bible, it is known merely as Salem, which means peace. Later, it becomes known as Jerusalem, which means they shall see peace. However, rather than this being an irony in contrast with what we observe in the media today, it is rather a promise of that which is to come, a promise that is reiterated throughout Scripture. Isaiah asks us to picture Zion's peace as a river flowing from Jerusalem. Ezekiel tells us of the day when God will make a covenant of peace with Israel in their midst. Haggai tells us that in Jerusalem God will give peace and Zechariah gives a vision of peace being established in Jerusalem. This continues right up until the end of the last book of the Bible which gives a glorious vision of New Jerusalem. Before we go on, I want to preface the scriptural references we turn up with something that you need to bear in mind. The name Zion throughout scripture is synonymous with Jerusalem. 2 Samuel 5 verses 6 to 7 tells us, And the king and his men went to Jerusalem unto the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, which spake unto David, saying, Except thou take away the blind and the lame, thou shalt not come in thither, hither. Rather, thinking David cannot come in hither. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, the same is the city of David. And David then went on to establish Jerusalem as his city, or Zion, as the throne from which he ruled over the land of Israel. Now, did you know that right now, Jerusalem is involved in the fulfillment of Bible prophecy? Come with me to Zechariah 12. Zechariah 12, and we'll read verses 2 and 3. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Now, while this prophecy is speaking of a time yet to come on this earth, that being the great battle of Armageddon, consider at the beginning of verse 3. I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone to all people. Jerusalem is a stone so weighty that the combined efforts of all the world powers to lift it out of conflict and contention only result on it falling upon them. We know, as I've outlined in my introduction, that the nation, nations have found the Jewish problem is far beyond man, man's capability to solve. It has given rise to the increasing threat of terrorism and suicide attacks. And today, Jerusalem remains central to the Arab-Israeli conflict and will continue to do so. There is no solution, no peace plan that is going to work for Jerusalem. The 65 plans that have failed in the past will continue to fail. Jerusalem will remain a burdensome stone until there is divine intervention that is promised in the Bible. Turn with me now to Psalm 48. And we'll turn to Psalm 48. Before I go on about Armageddon, I want to make this important point. No human endeavour will be able to bring peace to Jerusalem. The reason for this fact is that Jerusalem, indeed the land of Israel, and the entire world belongs to God. Reading Psalm, 104, so Psalm 48, verses 1 and 2. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion, in the sides of the north, the city of the great king. And verse 8. Ye have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, God will establish it forever. Jerusalem, or Zion, is God's and no others. It is not the Jews 
and it is not the Palestinians, not the Christians, nor any other political, religious, or ethnic group that may lay hold or claim to her. God, it is God's right to give it to whomsoever he will. He makes it clear in the scriptures that these recipients will be his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and those who are judged worthy to find a place in the kingdom that he will set up on earth at his return. Now, ladies and gentlemen, before peace must come war. This peace will come on God's terms. For it is only on God's terms that true and lasting peace can come to Jerusalem and indeed the world. The process of God bringing about his terms for peace on this world is the great battle of Armageddon. The Lord Jesus Christ, together with the immortalized saints, will intervene at Armageddon and fight all the nations gathered to Jerusalem to battle. Now the word Armageddon only occurs once in the Bible. Let's have a look at that in Revelation 16. And we'll read verses 14 to 18. Revelation 16, commencing at verse 14. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Now taking the pertinent points from these verses, we see that the whole world will be involved, gathered together, in a battle what it, that is termed that great day of God Almighty. Therefore it occurs at the instigation of God. And we see in verse 15, I, that is the Lord Jesus Christ, will come to the earth like a thief in the night. And in verse 16, the Lord Jesus Christ will gather the nations together into a place called Armageddon. And that we see that Armageddon is a Hebrew word. And at that time, there will be a great earthquake if you read further down. So Armageddon is a time of great warfare where God is involved. It is associated with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth and a great earthquake. And when we examine the Hebrew word Armageddon in Bible lexicons, we discover that it means a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. And when we look at verse 14 more closely of Revelation 16, we see that it is really an explanation of what Armageddon is all about. We can see there that God, working through the evil spirit of world leaders, draws the nations together for the purpose of executing his judgment on them. By that process, God, through the great warfare known as Armageddon, defeats the evil that is in the world today. In doing so, God demonstrates to a world that is largely ignorant of him that, and wants nothing to do with him that he is the supreme ruler and in total control. And so God brings into existence his terms for world peace. The result is ultimately that all people everywhere will worship him and live by his laws so that the mechanism that God uses to ensure that the world accepts the Lord Jesus Christ as the king will rule over the world at peace. Now Revelation 16 verse 16 stated that the word Armageddon was a Hebrew word. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew. So what I want to quickly do is look at a passage from the Old Testament in support of what we've just been looking at in Revelation. And that's Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14, verses 1 to 5. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished, and half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley, 
and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azale. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. The points I want to extract from these verses are that God will gather all nations to Jerusalem to fight against it. Once the atrocities of verse 2 have occurred, God through the agency of the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints will fight against those nations. And in the day when this occurs, the Lord Jesus Christ will stand on the Mount of Olives, resulting in a massive earthquake, so powerful that the mountain will be split in two. So what we have in combination are immortal saints who cannot die, fighting against those who oppose God and natural disasters which bring low the might and pride of mankind. Thereby God establishes world peace on his terms, thus ushering in a new world government with the Lord Jesus Christ as the king over all based in Jerusalem. To summarise, it might seem strange that in a talk on peace, I cover Armageddon, perhaps the biggest war the world has, will ever face. But remember, this peace comes on God's terms. Consider the world as a whole today. It would not be receptive to God, Jesus as king, or a new world government. Armageddon is necessary to cleanse the world of evil and bring it into submission to God's ways under Christ. It is a major step in the process by which God will bring about his purpose with the earth. That purpose, as we learn from Numbers 14 verse 21, is as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. And we have this repeated for us in Habakkuk 2.14. 14, for the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God, adding, as the waters shall cover the, cover the sea. To fill the earth with his glory... That is God's purpose. And the means by which he does this? By filling it with humans that exhibit his characteristics perfectly in their lives. Part of God's character is peace. And we learn this from Galatians 5. But what will peace for Jerusalem be like? Let's look at our introductory reading for tonight to commence answering this question. Isaiah 62. In Isaiah 62, the glorious hope for Jerusalem is outlined. This will be fulfilled be in fulfilment of God's promises centered on in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as saviour and king. We see that Israel is God's land and Jerusalem the city of the great king. They are to be the centre of the coming kingdom of God on earth. Let's read verse 1, and this is God speaking, remember. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. In verse 2 we learn that the, the, this light will shine forth to the nations and they will behold the righteousness of God. In verse 3 we learn that the times of the Gentiles will have ended with the great battle of Armageddon. Jerusalem will have become the capital city of the world. It will be as a crown of glory, the royal diadem, the delight of God. In verse 4 we learn that Jerusalem's deliverance this time will be permanent. Not like throughout history where it has been conquered and taken captive by successive world empires. It says that here, thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy hand any more be termed land any more be termed desolate. Jerusalem will forever remain in the hands of God's chosen peoples, dedicated to him in every way. No longer, verse, no longer forsaken, the promise of verse 8 is guaranteed. The Lord hath sworn by his right hand and by the arm of his strength, surely I will no more give the corn of the meat of thy, for thine enemies and the sons of the strangers shall not drink thy wine for the for the which thou hast labored no longer will those who have no claim or right 
to Jerusalem have any part in her. Instead, verse 9 teaches us the opposite will occur. But they that have gathered it shall eat it, and praise the Lord. And they that have brought it together shall drink it in the courts of my holiness. What a vision of peace and prosperity. A situation that can only come about because God makes it possible, ladies and gentlemen. At that time, as the end of verse 7 states, God will make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Continuing to read verse 11. Behold, the Lord hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, thy reward is with him, and his work before him. The Lord Jesus Christ applies these words to himself in Revelation 22 and verse 12, where he says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. He is the promised salvation, and the reward spoken of is the judgment of the responsible. And Revelation 22 and verse 14 goes on to tell us that those who receive the Lord's gift of life are those who do his commandments. But Isaiah continues, and his work is before him. This work of ruling for God in righteousness will be shared by those who at the judgment seat receive the gift of life. For the him at the end of verse 11 changes to them at the beginning of verse 12. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord. And thou shalt be called sought out, not a sought out, a, a city not forsaken. The fact that the Lord Jesus Christ comes with power when he returns shows that the nations will not willingly lay themselves at his feet. We have already seen that the battle of Armageddon is a necessary prelude to the reign of righteousness of his reign of righteousness and the establishment of peace for Jerusalem. As a result, she will be sought out, not a city, a city not forsaken. Now come back with me to Isaiah 2. Isaiah 2 and verses 2 to 4. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Here we see a prophecy of Jerusalem being sought out, a city not forsaken. Jerusalem will in fact be the capital of God's universal kingdom, constituting the centre of power, law, enlightenment and peace. For it will become the centre to which all nations will come for instruction in that glorious age. What a dramatic vision of a transformation from conflict to peace. Surely such a transformation is needed for Jerusalem. Rather than being devoted to the manufacture of in instruments of war, the city will be given over to agriculture. Nations will not war against each other, and war will not even be taught. This prophecy is echoed in Micah chapter 4. Micah chapter 4, verses 2 to 4. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people, and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, Neither shall they learn war any more, but they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. This is a prophecy speaking of the time when all nations will recognize Jerusalem as the capital of the world, the center of all learning concerning God and the place from which it emanates. 
Because of this, they will go there to worship God and to learn of his laws. The world will be ruled here by, from here by the Lord Jesus Christ, and there will no longer be any war in the world. Instead of arms manufacturing, life will involve peaceful pursuits such as agriculture. And verse 4 added a greater level of detail to this glorious vision of the future, of every man sitting under his vine and under his fig tree. Truly, a peaceful prospect. The chapter goes on to say in verse 7 that the Lord will, shall reign in Mount Zion. This prophecy is repeated so often in Scripture then there can be no, that there can be no doubt about it at all. Reading verse 11, Micah 4 and verse 11. Now also many nations are gathered against thee that say, Let her be defiled and let our eye look upon Zion. Again we see many nations shall be gathered against her for war. But we read further in verses 12 and 13. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel. For he shall gather them as the sheaves into the floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thy hoofs brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. God is in control. It is God's city, and it is he who will gather them as sheaves, as we saw when we looked at the great battle, again a reference to Armageddon. A heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. The sheaves or nations will find Jerusalem a very burdensome stone. Come across to Zechariah chapter 2. Here we have further details to expand our vision for Jerusalem. Zechariah 2, and we'll read verse 4. And said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls, for the multitude of men and cattle therein. Jerusalem is to be inhabited as villages. It is not merely to be a temple, but a real place for real people to live in, to dwell safely and in harmony with each other. In verse 8, we see the significance of Israel as the apple of God's eye. And verse 12 confirms this for us. And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion, in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Here we have God choosing Jerusalem again, choosing it above all the numerous cities that are on the face of this earth, raising its, lofty state, its status to lofty heights, surpassing all others. Now come back in with me into Isaiah, chapter 51. Right, we're going to read a few verses here. Isaiah 51, verse 3. And the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. Verse 11. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return, and come with singing unto Zion, and everlasting joy shall be upon her head. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Verse 17. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which hast drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunk in the dregs of the cup of trembling, and wrung them out. Verses 21 and 22. Therefore hear now this, thou afflicted and drunken, but not with wine. Thus saith the Lord, thus saith thy Lord, the Lord and thy God, that pleadeth the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken out of thine hand the cup of trembling, even the dregs of the cup of my fury. Thou shalt no more drink it again. Here God is saying that Jerusalem will become an oasis of joy and peace. Once it was a city of conflict steeped in blood, embroiled in intrigue, ravaged by war and never-ending conflict. Here is prophesied an end to all this, and a scene of utmost tranquility is depicted. Now turn across to chapter 52 and verse 1. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the circumcised and the unclean. And verse 9, Break forth into joy, sing together ye waste places of Jerusalem, 
For the Lord hath comforted his people, he hath redeemed Jerusalem. This prophecy is speaking of a time when Jerusalem will be liberated from those that have no right to have a possession of her. Jerusalem will become a strong and beautiful city because God will once more take possession of her. He will comfort her inhabitants with peace and prosperity. How can we doubt with so many scriptures focusing on Jerusalem that God's kingdom is to be here on earth with Jerusalem as its capital, the city of the great king? Great trouble is destined for Jerusalem in the battle of Armageddon, but great glory and peace will come out of it. Before we move on, let's consider Zechariah 8. Zechariah 8, verses 1 to 5. Again the word of the Lord of hosts came unto me, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I was jealous for Zion with great jealousy, and I was jealous for her with great fury. Thus saith the Lord, I am returned unto Zion, and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem shall be called a city of truth, and the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, there shall yet old men and old women dwell in the streets of Jerusalem, and every man and his with his staff in his hand for very age. And the streets of the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. We see here a vision for Jerusalem far from the reality which it faces today. Verse 2 tells us that God is jealous for Jerusalem with a great jealousy. That is because, as we have seen from previous quotes that we've looked at, Jerusalem forms part of the apple of his eye and is the city where he has chosen to put his name above every other city in the world. In verse 3, we have iter reiterated for us that Jerusalem is God's holy city. It will become the place where the immortalized saints who reflect his character and glory will reside and it is through them that he will dwell there. Verse 4 presents to us a picture of peace security and longevity quite the opposite to what we see today in fact in having a look at these verses it prompted me to do a quick internet search which revealed that the median age for Jerusalem in 2011 was 24 years that means that 50% of the population was under 24 and 50% above so quite a young population contrast that to Perth in 2013 35.5 years was the median age so quite a significant difference. I think these statistics are telling when we consider how safe Jerusalem is currently to live in. Clearly old age is not something readily achieved. The age of the people prophesied in this verse is such that they need a staff for support. Picturesque of a contented community respecting the aged in security and safety. And verse 5 shows us an idyllic scene of children playing in the streets of Jerusalem. Few cities in this world will be safe enough to play, allow sh children to play in their streets. I wouldn't allow my kids to play in the streets of Perth, let alone Jerusalem. And yet God has promised that it is not only possible, but certain. What a scene of happiness, joy and contentment in the peaceful environment to come to Jerusalem. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's topic however, is much broader than just Jerusalem. In order for Jerusalem to have peace, the world must also be at peace. You see, while Jerusalem is destined to become the capital of the world, it is really a representative of the whole. You don't need me to tell you that the world is in turmoil and experiencing problems like it has never experienced before. Peace for Jerusalem, and indeed the world, can only be made possible through one means, and that is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth. God the Creator will send his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, back to the earth, and he will set up God's kingdom right here on earth with Jerusalem as its capital. The Lord Jesus Christ is the answer to all the world's and to Jerusalem's problems. He alone, as the Son of God and the earth's future King, can fix the evil in the world and bring everlasting peace to Jerusalem. This is the purpose for which God caused them to be born. Come with me to Acts chapter 1. In verse 3 of Acts chapter 1, we come across the Lord Jesus Christ after he's been raised from the dead, teaching his disciples. Acts 1 and verse 3. 
to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Before he went to heaven to be with God, the Lord Jesus Christ spent 40 days on earth teaching the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He had achieved his purpose for which he was brought into the earth by God, that being taking away the sins of the world. Now his focus was on that which he would accomplish when he returns to the earth. That is the establishment of the kingdom of God. The disciples still thought that Jesus would set up the kingdom of God there and then, and hence they ask in verse 6, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And what was the reply? Verse 7, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. This was the Lord's way of saying, yes, the restoration of the kingdom of Israel will happen, but only God knows when that time will come. On numerous occasions, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke of his return to the earth and his ascension to power. For example, if you keep a uh, finger in Acts chapter 1, flick back to Matthew chapter 24. And verse, Matthew 24, verse 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And just across the page to chapter 25 and verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. The key words of these passages stand out clearly. The meaning is obvious. See the Son of Man coming with power and great glory. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. When the Lord Jesus Christ returns to the earth, he will return as the king of the whole world with the means to establish world peace on God's terms. The Bible contains more than 200 references to the second coming of Christ. The most well-known and explicit is for us in Acts chapter 1, if you'll come back there, and reading from verses 10 and 11. And while they, that is the disciples, looked steadfastly toward heaven, as Jesus went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Could anything be clearer than this? The Lord Jesus Christ will return to the earth in exactly the same way he went up to heaven, to exactly the same place, from which he left the earth. What will happen is this. God the Creator will send his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the earth where he will set up God's kingdom. He will return to the earth just as he left it. And Luke 1 verse 32 and 33 says that when he returns, the Lord Jesus Christ will sit on the throne of his father David, which was in Jerusalem. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. So we have the key to how God will bring about his terms for peace on the earth. He will send his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, back to the earth, who, because he is immortal, has the ability to make the changes in the world necessary to fill it with God's glory and bring peace. Now, the other aspect of our title that we have yet to consider is that Jerusalem is soon to be a city of peace. We all want to know when this will happen, but we don't actually know. But we do know that it will happen, and it must happen, soon. Luke 21, if you'll come across there, gives a prophecy concerning Jerusalem. And this prophecy was fulfilled in the main in AD 70, when the Romans besieged Jerusalem and the Jews were scattered across the world. And this prophecy is summarized for us in Luke 21 and verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The key we want to look at is, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. This began to be fulfilled in 1948. 
with when the State of Israel was declared. And then in 1967, when East Jerusalem also became under the control of the Jews, Jerusalem was no longer entirely trodden down of the Gentiles. It was in Jewish hands. Consider then the next few verses which must chronologically relate to times since 1967. Reading verses 25 and 26. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now the heavenly bodies spoken of here are symbolically used throughout the scripture to describe political and religious powers. The sea and the waves speak of people and nations, and these certain verses certainly describe the world in turmoil today. Now reading verse 31. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come, to, things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. This is telling us that the Lord, return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth to set up God's kingdom and usher in the age of peace is nigh at hand because these things are coming to pass. Reading on in verse 32. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Here we see that the generation that sees these things will not pass away until Christ has come. We, ladies and gentlemen, are witnessing these things occurring in Jerusalem and the world right now. We are fully confident, therefore, that the Lord Jesus Christ will return to establish Jerusalem as a city of peace in our lifetime. Verse 33. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. What further assurance can we possibly need? God has spoken it. Therefore, it will happen. We can trust the word of God. He is faithful to fulfill all these things and, will come, and it will come to pass. We can have confidence that while we do not know the day or the hour, the day is at hand and Jerusalem will soon be a city of peace. Tonight we have set before you the hope that we have bound up in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a city close to the hearts of those who love the Bible and who worship God in truth. We have seen that the future of Jerusalem is beautiful, even though down through history it has been known, it is, and now is plagued by struggles and wars, and for this reason is constantly the centre of world's attention. But for all the fighting and struggling, Jerusalem is God's city, and he and he alone will create its peaceful future. What a glorious future that is in store for the world and Jerusalem. The return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth to reign from Jerusalem will herald a time of peace such as the world has never known since mankind has been put upon it. Jerusalem will be the political and religious centre for the world. God's laws will emanate from it and be taught to the nations. The whole world will be united in worship and teaching of God. Men will worship at the temple to be set up at Jerusalem. Jerusalem will one day have peace, but it will not be through the efforts of men. This is an awesome hope that can inspire us despite the darkness of the world around us. That future, as we have seen, includes a worldwide dominion with Jesus Christ as King. And through him, we can have the opportunity of eternal life in that kingdom. This is the hope of the gospel that we extend to you tonight. The call of the gospel is an invitation to accept the way of the Lord Jesus Christ as, and become associated with his glorious future. Those who willingly heed the call of the gospel are baptised into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and live, a lo and live a life of obedience to his commandments and have an opportunity and a hope to gain eternal life. Together with Christ, those who are made immortal will rule the earth from the world's future capital, Jerusalem the city of peace.